I now give the floor to Ms. Hajatma Wikramanan Yakit. I'm sorry. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for the invitation. We are in the midst of an unprecedented global challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic has swept through our world, leaving everyday life as we know it at a standstill. Schools, businesses, markets, and bus stations where young people used to hang out are now deserted. Entire cities have transformed into ghost towns overnight. While decision makers are trying to navigate uncharted waters, we have seen an image grow from the media of the world's young people acting irresponsible and reckless, not understanding the gravity of the situation, putting the lives of others in danger by going into beaches, pubs and parties. As usual, we have seen a focus on the small minority of young people who disregarded guidelines and instructions, risking their own health and safety of others, completely sidelining the thousands of young people who were already fighting in the front lines of the crisis. Nowhere in the news did we hear about young peace builders in Kenya and Cameroon who immediately adapted their peace building organizations and networks to prepare their communities to face COVID-19. The news didn't focus on the many young health workers and medical students attending to patients in China and Italy. The news didn't tell us about the scouts, the girl guides, and the Red Cross youth volunteers running awareness campaigns, hand washing campaigns in Haiti and Jordan. The headlines didn't recognize young people 3D printing face masks and fundraising in support of charities here in the United States. Therefore, allow me to dedicate my statement today to all the young people who are putting their communities ahead of themselves within war zones, within refugee camps, within favelas, and within settlements, showcasing grit and leadership that sometimes we even fail to see in our own political leaders. President of the Security Council, Excellencies, Secretary General, fellow young people. Public discourse often portrays young people as irresponsible, self-interested group. We quickly categorize young men as easily attracted to violence and part of gangs or extremist groups and young women always as victims of these scenarios. But contrary to these popular narratives, if we care to take a closer look at the communities most affected, what conflicts, disasters, and crises teach us over and over again is that young people are not only the most resilient, but also the most innovative and resourceful during turbulent times. Born into and growing up in an exceedingly interconnected world, young people understand very well that solidarity is the name of the game. They understand that just like the COVID-19 pandemic, conflict, violence, inequality, and climate change do not stop at national boundaries, that none of us is safe unless we all are. Excellencies, this year we mark the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the Security Council Resolution 2250. We are also marking 20 years of Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. With unprecedented global challenges surrounding us all, the United Nations is ready to celebrate its 75th birthday, reflecting on its past, but most importantly, looking into its future. This is an opportune moment for us to take stock of the youth peace and security agenda, its progress and wins, but also its challenges and gaps. I'm sure we all agree that the future of our communities, countries and entire world depend on building peaceful and resilient generations. This is also a strategic moment to further increase synergies among these various agendas so young people in all their diversity can contribute as equal partners in deciding what kind of a future they will inherit. Therefore, allow me to thank the government of the Dominican Republic for its leadership in convening this Security Council briefing. I'm pleased to join the Secretary General and two young peace builders, Ola from Yemen and Gatwal from South Sudan, as we reflect on the key messages and recommendations of the first ever Secretary General's report on youth peace and security. This important report saw daylight at a vital time when the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic were emerging. In order to adjust to the current realities, innovative and new approaches to translate youth peace and security policy into practice are needed. While the report documents important practices, lessons and commitments that have emerged from the implementation of this agenda, a clear strategy 
co-led by young people and member states, especially at the country level, is needed. Since 2015, the Secretary General's reports presented to the Council have increasingly discussed the situation of young people, with an increase from 21% of reports in 2016 to 39% in 2019. However, we still have a lot to do in mainstreaming and embedding youth peace and security across UN efforts. As an example, out of 253 resolutions adopted by the Security Council since 2015, only 16% include meaningful references to youth. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to note that the Secretary General's report on youth peace and security is grounded in the five core pillars of the Resolution 2250 and draws from the strategic and comprehensive recommendations made in the missing piece, the Independence Progress Study on Youth Peace and Security, presented to this Council in April 2018. Based on the report, my key recommendations today echo the voices of young people who I have interacted with during my country missions around the world. And those who participated in the survey I carried out on social media just before this briefing, as well as in the wider consultations carried out by UN partners, member states and civil society in preparation of the Secretary General's report. Firstly, young people believe that there is a need to create more meaningful partnerships between youth, civil society organizations, government institutions that work on the YPS agenda. Five years down the line, to date, there are no national action plans on YPS. But I'm pleased to note that in some countries, these are in the process of development. For a national roadmap to be successful, a participatory, transparent, and youth-led process with adequate resources are needed. Since Resolution 2250 was adopted, we have seen an increase in the creation of national coalitions on youth peace and security. I encourage all member states to establish multi-stakeholder mechanisms to meaningfully engage young people in planning and decision-making on peace-building, post-conflict reconstruction, and discussions on resource allocations. Secondly, meaningful participation of all young people towards building sustainable peace should be ensured. Participation is recognized as a human right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All young people have the right to participate in the conduct of public affairs and thus are entitled to rights and freedoms. Such participation encompasses a wide range of actions, from formal participation in political, electoral or peace processes to informal participation at the community level and in digital spaces. Enabling spaces should be created for young people where they are seen and respected as citizens with equal rights, equal voices and equal influence. Although inclusion has shown to positively impact the sustainability of peace agreements, young people continue to be excluded from decisions that directly affect their present and future prospects for peace. The key outcome from the first international symposium on youth participation in peace processes hosted in Helsinki in March 2019 demonstrated that young people will either inherit a peace agreement's long-term benefits or long-term consequences. Therefore, I call on all member states to create meaningful opportunities for young people to participate both formally and informally in peace processes. As the policy paper we are here, I presented to this council last year recognizes this can be inside, around, or beyond negotiation rooms. Finally, young people believe that strong mechanisms should be developed to protect young activists and peace builders, as the Secretary General mentioned. Young activists are facing various threats from state and non-state actors for building peace in their communities and represents for cooperating with the United Nations. These threats include physical, legal, political, sociocultural, digital and financial threats. In the times of COVID-19, with lockdowns, curfews and increased surveillance online and offline, civic space has continued to shrink worldwide, risking progress to stall. To date, no data is systematically collected on human rights violations of young peace builders and human rights defenders throughout the world, and in most cases, these violations remain undocumented or uninvestigated.
Therefore, I call on member states' support to facilitate an inclusive, safe, enabling, and gender responsive environment in which young peace builders and young human rights defenders are recognized and provided with adequate support and protection to carry out their work independently and without undue interference. Excellencies, what do we see as the collective way forward? As you are aware, operationalizing the youth peace and security agenda requires coordination, coherence, and integration, as well as political will and commitment. These recommendations cannot be implemented without sufficient funding and accountability from the UN system and its member states. Flexible and easily accessible funding for youth-led and youth-focused organizations through the PBF or other means, and for the United Nations and other civil society partners is urgently needed to further advance the YPS agenda. I also strongly recommend the Council to consider regular and systematic reporting on the implementation of resolutions 2250 and 2419 to ensure sustainability and continuity of these important agendas. Tracking progress is vital to ensure accountability. Shifting to a meaningful partnership-based approach, especially with civil society and youth-led organizations, is critical not only for this agenda, but for youth engagement and participation in all aspects of life, as outlined in the UN Youth Strategy, Youth 2030. In conclusion, Excellencies, if the United Nations and the Security Council fail to translate agreed resolutions into action, in a nutshell, if this agenda do not be brought down from a global policy level to a regional and country level with programmatic action, young people will lose opportunities to meaningfully participate and most importantly, their trust in institutions and multilateralism will further erode. We cannot afford to lose the trust of young people, the greatest asset and the greatest hope we have for a better future. Therefore, I urge the Council to put young people at the heart of its efforts to bring global peace and security. Young people are ready and up for this challenge. The question is, are national, regional and international actors ready to bridge the intergenerational divide? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ayafma for her briefing.